Kyle was appointed Vice President of Student Affairs at UVU in November of 2017. For four years before this role, Dr. Reyes served as UVU's Chief Inclusion and Diversity <coughs> Officer and led the development and implementation of UVU's nationally recognized strategic inclusion plan with nearly 40 initiatives focused on making UVU a more welcoming and inclusive campus for all students. He's now in his 16th year at UVU. Um, Dr. Reyes is also an assistant professor of education at UVU and taught courses in multicultural education, arts integration, <laughs> and family and community partnerships. Um, Kyle also serves on the board of directors for Asian Pacific Americans in Higher Education, Envision Utah, the United Way of Utah County, the Utah Chapter of the National Association of Multicultural Education, and the Utah Governor's Multicultural Commission. Um, Kyle received his PhD in Educational Leadership and Policy from the University of Utah. And we're grateful for his time. He's clearly a busy guy, so I'll turn the time over to Kyle. Thanks so much, sir. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be with you today. Uh, let me just get the clicker here and make sure we're ready to go. Uh, I was just telling Belinda that when I've come in the past to speak to the mastermind group, uh, I've spoken primarily on diversity and inclusion stuff. And that this time I decided to change it up quite a bit actually because of something that I've been working on. Uh, and that is the linkage between creativity and leadership. And so if in another context you want to get me nerdy on issues of global connection and diversity and inclusion, I'm happy to do that. But today is all about sort of finding your spark and being more deliberate with your impact on the world around you, if that's okay, right? Um, also, I decided to just get a little bit personal about my background. Uh, and rather than do that in a series of slides, I'll just tell you. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. My mom's from the Big Island of Hawaii. She's Hawaiian Japanese. My father's from the Philippines. And so I grew up in San Fernando, California, uh, right off the 101 freeway. Is anybody familiar with Southern California and the freeway talks? Okay. It's true. We talk in freeway. That's how we navigate our way around. And I went to Canoga Park High School, and I was a graffiti artist. In fact, I still am. I'm a street artist. I do murals. I, do, I was the advisor. Until we got rid of advisors here on campus, I was the advisor for the uh, graffiti art club, which is cult Cultural Cans Crew. And then I was the advisor for the hip hop club, which uh, was Mosaic Dance Group with Ashley Kimsey. We started that seven years ago. And uh, Filipino club, and anyway, just a number of things. I've had seven jobs here at UVU. And for 10 years, I served in the office of the president. I served as his chief of staff for five years, chief diversity officer for four years, and a prof professor in the School of Education. So if anybody was, is preparing to become a teacher, elementary or secondary education, you would have had to take my class, but now I'm no longer teaching. I'm just full-time administration, which I'm kind of sad about, but it's part of the journey. In addition to that, my partner, my wife, she's Navajo. She's from the Navajo Nation. So my kids are Hawaiian, Japanese, Filipino, and Navajo. And they have very long names, I promise you. Just trust me. Belinda, am I right? Amen. Amen. A lot of vowels in the names between Hawaiian and Navajo. And so uh, that's a little snapshot. I, I give that to you because so much of what I'm going to talk about, I'm jumping right into creativity. Belinda has seen me present enough to know that usually I talk about cultural backgrounds because it helps us identify our identities. And by identifying our identities, we know who we are. And therefore, we know how we can make an impact on the world. Today, I gave you that brief snapshot about, about my background, just so you know um, how I'm approaching creativity and leadership. My father was an artist from the Philippines, my mother an educator. And so my graffiti background has actually informed many of the artistic adventures that I've been involved in. Everything from uh, designing blankets to cell phone cases, this is my design, to, as you will see pretty soon here, uh, creative writing and some other things. Now, I don't share that in any sort of, wow, that is an amazing piece of art. I have decided to, rather than take a talent that I think I have, <laughs> and instead of doing community decorating on people's walls, I've tried to take that energy and harness it into something more productive. Um, but it's also been a navigation of my impact. And I want to talk about this idea. This is the coolest picture I could find about a, a, with, a, with a match strike. And this idea you'll, of, of having impact on purpose, meaning 
we're all going to have an impact on, on people in this world. And whether you like it or not, you've already had an impact on people. Some of it has been passive impact. Sometimes your silence is an impact. Sometimes your lack of action is an, actually having an impact on people around you. People are watching constantly. I tell folks, every interaction you have is basically an interview. Don't be, don't be stressed by that. But every time you meet somebody, it's an interview at some level. Every connection you make, every person that you meet is at some level an interview for further connections and further um, uh, bridges to be built. If I meet you, and what's your name? Hannah. Hannah, Kyle, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. If I remember Hannah's name in about five minutes, that's going to leave an impact on you, okay? If you remember my name in about five minutes, hopefully it's just right there. <laughs> if you remember my name, that's great. Later on, we have another interaction, and I see you in the hallway, and I say, hey, Hannah. Um, or you'll probably say, hey, Kyle, and I'm like, ooh, I know I met you at the mastermind, remind me one more time, and all of a sudden it gets in my mind. And every interaction, we have a smile, and we say, hey, nice to meet you. If you said, hey, I'm Hannah, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, I doubt Hannah would like to have any more interactions with me, right? There is something about every data point that we're connecting with where we either say, I want more of that connection, or I want less of it. And we're in classes all the time where we have teachers and professors where we're like, yeah, after the first lecture, don't want to be in this class for the rest of the semester. <laughs> Sometimes they grow on you, they get better. And other professors, right, right out of the gate, there's like this connection and you're like, I think I'm going to have a good time at least learning, excited about learning. And so this idea of impact is I just want to have you start thinking through, do you actually want to have an impact with purpose? Meaning. Do you want to be deliberate in the type of impact you leave on this world? Okay? And so that's where we're going. Creativity and leadership. This is, this, and I'll let you know when it's time to get engaged on this. This is where you get engaged. Uh, we're going to treat part of this like a classroom. So how are these two linked? No wrong answer. I'm just trying to get uh, some ideas. How are these two concepts of leadership and creativity linked? Three hands right in a row here. Boom, boom, boom. Yes? Be willing to stand out. Excellent. Elaborate on that at all? Be willing to stand out? Creatively, you don't want to reproduce what everybody else has done. And leadership-wise, if you're leading, you are being looked at independently, and you should have independent ideas. Excellent. Yes. Beautiful. OK. I love that. Here, and then here, and then here. Yes. So you have to think creatively to figure out what options are going to do the make most good for the most amount of people and what's going to be most beneficial. And a lot of times you're going to have to use your creativity because there's not one set way to do yeah. one thing. There's a million and a half ways to do it for a million and a half people. I love that because you're now bridging even the value of diversity of our groups and, our, and, and the folks that we lead. Uh, in order for us to address their needs, we have to be more creative because there are diverse needs. Yes, here and then here. Amen. I was going to say the same. Oh, thing. really? You know, like to lead people, you have to be able to creatively uh, understand the unique individual traits that each person has. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. You've already jumped to the punchline, which I love. <laughs> Slide about 17. Stay with me, though, <laughs> right? Because creativity, we're going to do a quiz here in just a second. And I think some of you might either right now think that you're either creative people or you don't, you, you're, you're not. And we're going to try to debunk that. Yeah. Well, I think one of the coolest things about leadership is it is the opportunity to help others bring out their creativity. Yes. I think it's really important as leaders to focus on letting the people that you're leading be creative. OK, y'all are like ahead of the game. So <laughs> let's just go there because the reconception of leadership over time, and Belinda and her team can tell you all the literature on various iterations of where leadership has been focused over the years. Many years ago, there was this notion that leaders, you, were, you sort of inherently had leadership qualities or you didn't, right? And leaders were supposed to be tall, they were supposed to be all-knowing, they were supposed to be able to speak publicly really well, and in many of the research, uh, m many of the, uh, the studies early on, people attributed leadership to very masculine or male-associated characteristics. 
That was uh, what our colleagues uh, have called the great man theory. And you can tell that that is an outdated theory for many, many reasons. Not only is it outdated because it's approaching things from a singular trait based, meaning it's hard to learn new leadership, but they're focusing in on just one sort of conception of what good leaders are. And I want to um, unpack this for a little bit. There's only a few slides that I'll read that, I'll, uh, that will read the entire slide together. Trust me, I, I, I try not to have too many of these slides, but will somebody please read this out loud? Please do. Soak that in for just a second, and let me collapse it down. Throughout our lives, we're all going to have these moments where we're going to be figuratively tapped on the shoulder for something marvelous and remarkable. What a tragedy would be if at that moment we are not prepared to sort of step into that opportunity, right? And so part of this is also breaking through some of your fears on creativity, all right? And, and I see some of you taking pictures. You're fine. Keep taking pictures of the slides. I will provide this whole slideshow to Belinda. She can send it out to you. But continue to engage. I like the note taking. I like that. It helps my professorial lenses. All right. <laughs> Leadership and vision. Um, one more uh, volunteer. Okay. Please. If you want to build a ship, don't drum, drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Wow. So. Profound. Unpack this with me. What, are the, what is this person saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. And President Holland was our, our teacher. For I've heard of him. Of I've yeah, heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of low-key guy, but he was cool. Um, but we, we started off the class with this, um, kind of talking about passion and vision. Yeah. Um, not just starting with a list of things to do, but when you have this drive within you, it will help you achieve what you didn't think you could before. Yeah. And as a good leader, you're not just instilling a list of things to do, but that same passion with them through your example. Yeah. What else? Yeah, Beautiful, I like thank this. you. I think it uh, resembles that creativity <laughs> we were talking about because if you're telling people, do this, do that, do this, that's all their mind is thinking about. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to go back and ask, what do you need me to do next? Yeah. But if you teach them to have that passion, that you have that desire, that they're going to come up with their own ideas, their own creativity, um, and maybe go above and beyond what you originally expected. I love that. In fact, You'll see here in a video in just a second from Sir Ken Robinson as he talks about this idea of the element. He talks about how the schooling process, and you can agree with him or disagree, but he's basically, his argument is, and the way he was made himself famous is his, this argument. Sometimes schooling schools creativity out of children because they're not allowed to fail, right? And they're not allowed to have an iterative process. And so they're supposed to do what? Remember facts and spit them back out on a times test. And somehow we're supposed to create creative problem solvers. And he's like, Mm -mm. Sorry, who, yes? Um, I think this quote is interesting because if you think about the, the leader who has the blueprint for the boat, yeah. um, you get, if, if you're to divide it up, you got to do what you where you give them orders, you only get that boat, right? Um, but if you look at ah. the vast and endless sea, you could have a yacht, you could have a pirate ship, right? Like there are lots of different ways in which these people can solve this problem. Totally. Let me translate that to, to something that I'm trying to wrestle with right now. So um, as Vice President of Student Affairs, I'm over an area of 26 different departments on campus. You might have heard of them. Cal, um, <laughs> admissions, multicultural center, graduation office, some of these offices. Any office that's a, a service for students that's outside the classroom. Does that make sense? So 26 different departments, and our primary uh, uh, purpose is to serve you. I was talking to John Curl, the director of financial aid. All of you have interacted at some point with our financial aid somebody because you've accessed some financial aid. Well, John Curl, he said, you know, sometimes our financial aid advisors, whose jobs are so critical to remove barriers for you to be able to get funding for your schooling, right? It can get fairly monotonous, right? It's like, okay, let's take a look at your FAFSA. Let's see when it's coming in. Oh, your EFC number is this. This means you'll probably get your award. We'll notify you when you get your award. Then you have to accept it and all this stuff, right? And he said, 
let's talk about how do we get them to, to this. And so we started talking and unpacking with it a little bit. And, and we, in the conversation, we were sitting there and all of a sudden I said, you realize you're not just processing financial aid applications, right? You're totally empowering students to fulfill their dreams by removing barriers from their schooling process. And one of them was like, that's the first time in my life I've heard that. Because for every day I was just processing financial aid applications. And so this kind of idea of finding your why, that finding your purpose, finding your spark, is so tied to this idea of creativity and creatively being able to project. My, my, my wife's birthday was over the weekend, okay? So her, one of her favorite cookies is a chocolate, three different chocolate chips all in one cookie. So it's a milk chocolate, dark chocolate 60% cacao, <laughs> dark chocolate 70% cacao. I don't even know how to pronounce that. So we're making these chocolate chip cookies with me and my nine-year-old daughter. Thank you for whoever's laughing so, so much. I love that. So, so we're making these chocolate chip cookies and we've got the recipe, right? We're following a recipe. That's what you do when you make cookies. Unless you're my nine-year-old daughter who was like, so I'm over there and I'm following the recipe and she's like, let's put in more sprinkles. And I'm like, I'm looking over there. I'm like, that's not on the recipe. And I'm like, hmm. I go for it. And I'm stressing out, right? And I'm like, yeah, go for it. And she's like, sprinkles. And then she's like, oh, what if we put in these? You know, mom loves almond shavings. And I'm like, yeah, almond shavings. And I'm like, and she's like, these are unicorn tears. And I'm like, no, no, they're almond shavings. And I'm, like, I'm like that bad dad. So she's throwing all this stuff into my beautiful mixture of, of cookies. And I'm like, oh boy. And I'm like, how about we make two batches? So I separate out like the regular batch and then, I, and then I have her batch and she's going to town and she's like sprinkles and love. We're making it for mom, right? Well, we bake these things and my cookies turn out great, but her cookies turn out spectacular. And this just happened yesterday, folks. Like there's something about the, un, the, the sort of in my mind, I'm thinking rules. I'm an adult now. I'm thinking you. I've tried that before, it's gonna go horribly wrong. And she's thinking love for her mom. She's like, sprinkles is the symbol of love for my mom, right? <laughs> and so what did Michelle do? Michelle's like, oh, thank you. And every bite had like chocolate and sprinkles and almonds and Lucky Charms. And she's like, ah! <laughs> and she's eating it and she's like, oh, this is awesome. And Kayumi is like, oh, yay. And we don't allow enough of that to happen in this world, right? We don't allow enough of that to happen. Why? Because we're like, oh, I know how to do it right. And I find it in myself, folks. This is happening all around us. My, my, by the way, my daughter wasn't caring about gathering the wood or dividing the work or just doing the, the things. She was, she was like, I want mom to feel love today. That's the vast and endless sea. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to put whatever I can in here to make her feel loved. I don't care if it comes out but she's gonna feel my love, right? I mean, that's, there's something powerful there. Okay, just a few more of these long ones. Who wants to read this one? Thank you. There are no simple existing models or programs <coughs> that will be sufficient to develop the levels of collective leadership required to meet an increasingly complex future. Instead, an era of rapid innovation will be needed in which organizations experiment with new approaches that combine diverse ideas Yes, diversity and creativity. The complex future, folks, let's be real. In five years, 10 years from now, the world is gonna look a little bit different. And we talk about how in higher education, we're training folks for jobs that haven't even been created yet in many ways. Please. Do you know when next future country will be this I don't, I don't, yeah. Oh, is it, oh uh, sorry, I didn't know if you like a specific, it was a while ago. It was many decades ago, actually. This was many decades ago. I thought you were saying, like, was this last year? Was this something? Um, no, this was, I mean, this, Nick Petrie, this work was probably, I want to say, 50s or 60s. We can probably, somebody can probably Google this right now. But um, the, the idea is, this is, um, it's applicable for every generation to consider new technologies, right? Complex problems. Here's the other thing. On rapid innovation and complex future, um, notice that this is not putting the hands, putting the leadership in one person. This is a collective responsibility. Let me look at this one. 
Um, and I'm going to read this one. The old model of leadership held that only those in positions of power could be great leaders. This is an elitist view that assumed that there are distinct roles, leaders and followers. And look at this part. Reality is much more complex. Any member of an organization can exert leadership. One does not need a title to demonstrate a capacity to bring about change. These contemporary views of leadership highlight the emerging role creativity plays in leadership effectiveness. And the final here with Puccio, Manche, and Murdoch, leaders cannot have all the answers. And I'm going to jump down here. Therefore, leaders must not only rely on their own creativity, but must also be adept at facilitating the creati creative thinking of others. And I want to spend the rest of today jump-starting your creativity, thinking through, so, so what would we do next? How do we get more of this? But let's do a, qu let's do a quiz real quick. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to have you uh, rate yourself on intelligence, okay? And I'm going to start at 1, and I'm going to go all the way to 10. Now, I will not judge you either way. Like, if you give yourself a 10, you're like, mm, I'm there. <laughs> That's fine. You're fine. If you rate yourself a 1, we can have a motivational speech afterwards. <laughs> but intelligence, I'm going to start. Anybody? 1. This is how you rate yourself. 2. 3. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and own it, 10. Okay. Creativity. I'm going to have to do the same thing now. Creativity. I'm going to start at a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Nine, ten? Yes, thank you. A few tens in the room. Uh, did anybody make any observations about the group as a whole? What was the higher rating, intelligence or creativity? Okay, on the, on the high end, nine and ten, there were more, but actually we had on creativity, we had more people uh, weighing in on three, four, and five already. So the range there. Were your numbers different on creativity and intelligence? We won't have time to go into the full analysis of that. Ken Robinson would say he would like to invite you to consider that your intelligence is tied to your creativity and your creativity tied to your intelligence. So if you would rate yourself 10 on one of them, whatever the higher number is, take that number for both of them. And here's his argument. Here's his argument. When I say creativity, what immediately comes to mind when I say, are you a creative person? What immediately comes to your mind? Art. Did, does that come to, for most people? Art? Okay, what else? Anything else besides art? Yes? Innovation. Innovation problem solving. Okay? If I think of like adapting, you just like adapt to your surroundings if you're creative enough to do that. Excellent. I know this is silly, but I think of creativity with a sense of independence in the sense that creative people don't have to be nudged to be creative. They don't have to be nudged to think of ideas. Like it just comes to them and they yeah. just have yeah. And so I link a lot of <coughs> that independence, like, in, in my head, and that might not be true. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. Yes? When I think of creativity, I think of, I have to bring what if. Ah, considering new possibilities. But it's interesting that when we first ask the question, a lot of people think something artistic on creativity. Did I see another hand over here? Okay. Um, two great books. Uh, the one is by Ken Robinson, The Element. Has this group been introduced to Ken Robinson yet? No? Okay. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson has four books out now. And these are all about um, infusing creativity throughout the world and really reclaiming our educational spaces to be think tanks of creativity because he thinks that we are becoming factories of, um, with like treating students as just cogs. We kind of don't care what you get in your grades or anything or whatever you create. We're just going to move you on to the next grade and then just pass you along, we're gonna keep passing you along, and, and then you take high stakes tests, and then you are given a value called your ACT or SAT score and your GPA. We're gonna actually put a value on you, and that value is gonna be equated to a dollar amount because scholarships are tied to that value, and then all of a sudden we have these narratives of I'm stupid or I'm smart or I'm creative or I'm not. And as adults, we get that reinforced to us in various college classrooms, and then we hit the workforce, and all of a sudden we're like, wait, I'm actually empowered to do some really amazing things. Why, didn't, why wasn't this a part of my entire schooling system? To solve really complex issues, right? The other one is Big Magic. 
This is one of my favorite books by Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote the, a book, Eat, Pray, Love. You might have seen the movie of Eat, Pray, Love. And uh, she wrote this book, Big Magic, and it's basically create, creative living beyond fear. This is basically finding your balance in creativity. If you think you're creative, great, but find an anchor, meaning you can't just sort of say, you know what, I'm just going to live as the day comes and never not be tethered to anything because I'm such a free spirit. And so I'm just going to paint on any tree I see because I just, wow. And then, and then somebody else is like, oh, that looks like something I could probably just eat because it's green and I'm just going to try to nibble on this chair because I'm so creative. And I'm so, she's like, wait, what? You have to still be grounded in some sense of an anchor of reality in some way. And so she's like, big magic, her invitation is finding your spark is all about really finding what naturally excites you and you can't describe why. Like, you, you just, you, you, there are certain things where if I give you a list of 20 things, there's going to be one or two of those on there. They're like, I'd like to learn more about those two things. The rest of it sounds super boring to me, right? Now, could you learn to love new topics? Sure, that's what higher education is all about, is being introduced to things and you didn't realize you were so good at this scientific world. But there also are these natural sort of tendencies you have to say, and we call them strengths, and where we can say, wow, I'm gravitating towards something that is a spark within me, right? So two books to check out. I want you to listen to Ken Robinson talk about one particular uh, student that he worked with. I'm doing a new book at the moment called Epiphany, which is uh, based on a series of interviews with people about how they discovered their talent. I'm fascinated by how people got to be there. Uh, it's really prompted by a conversation I had with a wonderful woman who may, most people have never heard of. She's called Gillian Lynn. Have you heard of her? Some have. She's a choreographer and everybody knows her work. She did Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She's wonderful. I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet in England, as you can see. And uh, <laughs> anyway, Gillian and I had lunch one day. I said, how'd you get to be a dancer? And she said it was interesting. When she was at school, she was really hopeless. And the school in the 30s wrote to her parents and said, we think Gillian has a learning disorder. You couldn't concentrate, she was fidgeting. I think now they'd say she had ADHD, wouldn't you? But this was the 1930s and ADHD hadn't been invented you know, at this point, so it wasn't an available condition. You know, people, people, people weren't aware they could have that. Anyway, she sent, went to see this, um, this specialist so this oak panel room and, and she was there with, uh, with her mother and she was led and sat on this uh, chair at the end and she sat on her hands for 20 minutes while this man talked to her mother about all the problems Gillian was having at school. And at the end of it, um, because she was disturbing people, her homework was always late and so on, little kid of eight. In the end, uh, the, uh, the doctor went and sat next to Gillian and said, Gillian, I've listened to all these things that your mother's told me, I need to speak to her privately. So she said, he, he said, wait here, we'll be back, we won't be very long, and, and, uh, and they went and left her. But as they went out the room, he turned on the radio that was sitting on his desk. And when they got out the room, he said to her mother, just stand and watch her. And um, the minute they left the room, she said she was on her feet, moving to the music. And they watched for a few minutes, and he turned to her mother, and he said, you know, Mrs. Lynn, Gillian isn't sick, she's a dancer. <laughs> Take her to a dance school. I said, what happened? said, she did. I can't tell you so how wonderful it was. We walked in this room, and it was full of people like me. People who couldn't sit still. People who had to move to think. Who had to move to think. They did ballet, they did tap, they did jazz, they did modern, they did contemporary. She was eventually auditioned for the Royal Ballet School. She became a soloist. She had a wonderful career at the Royal Ballet. She eventually graduated from the Royal Ballet School, found, found her own company, the Gillian Dance Company, met Andrew Lloyd Webber. She's been responsible for some of the most successful musical theatre productions in history. She's given pleasure to millions, and she's a multi-millionaire. Somebody else might have put her on medication and told her to calm down. So it's interesting, right? I mean, our schooling, I'm, I'm an educator of educators. So I teach teachers who are about to go make a difference in the world. And I, try to in, I taught a couple classes, multicultural education, and I taught arts-based integration. That is, how to use theatre, music, dance, and uh, visual arts to bring alive all the other subjects, okay? Some of the um, quotes from, from his book, The Element. I want you to focus on the second one here. Finding and developing our creative strengths is an essential part of becoming who we really are. We don't know what we can be until we know what we can do. When people are in their element, they connect with something fundamental to their sense of identity, purpose, and well-being. And we're gonna come back to that at the very end, this idea of authenticity. 
I'm not sure if anybody in here has ever tried to explore this idea of feeling authentic or being an authentic leader. You've heard of authentic leadership, perhaps. Um, and, uh, and now we're going to get into sort of the four or five things that I, that I think we should pay attention to as we jumpstart our creativity. Um, I'm going to move past this one. So creativity takes courage. Look afresh at things. Develop a growth mindset. Setting visible goals. We will have, um, I'll, I'll show you four ways to jumpstart your creativity. And then final word on authenticity. Live life deliberately. So first, creativity takes courage. Um, the essential part of creativity is not being afraid to fail. What's interesting about uh, trying new things and, and innovators and inventors is this idea that they don't think that they will find it on the first try. They know that it's going to take iteration after iteration. Creativity is so key when it comes to problem solving. But in the world that we live in right now, we do not give license for people to make mistakes. So for example, I've been in a leadership meeting recently where a leader said, we cannot afford to make a mistake. Literally, we can't afford it. If anybody makes a mistake, you're done. And I was like, ooh, that's a, that's a lovely environment to work in, right? And so what does that do? It not only adds pressure and adds anxiety and adds, but people, can they perform at their best when they're under that sort of pressure? No. And what happens then is they are saying, because of efficiencies and because of the world, it, everything moves so rapidly, they can't afford to make mistakes. Well, the, most, the, the companies that have actually thrived the most are those that say, we actually have a whole group of folks over here that are making mistakes all the time. They're trying new things. It's called a research and development team, an R&D team. And you need to develop within your own life, your own personal R&D team, your research and development team. Whatever you think you're going to be doing, try new things over here on the side. Just always have your hand in something new. This, we won't have time to watch the whole clip, but let me walk you through this. Haven't you seen the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks and Kevin Bacon? If you haven't, it's an entire movie about solving problems. This particular video clip, which is about five minutes, walks through a crisis. In fact, this crisis led to the famous Houston, we have a problem. Houston being back at headquarters and these astronauts stuck in space and what happened is the carbon dioxide levels were rising and uh, they didn't know how to, uh, to, to stop that in terms of a certain filter. So they are all of a sudden, uh, the, the team back in Houston is saying, how do we fix this? They put everything that they have, that's, they said, okay, this is all the materials they would have up in the shuttle and they put it out on the table and they said, okay, we've got to make this round hole, round two fit into this square peg, I mean square hole, and do it with only the things on this table, go. So they created some stuff, and this is, again, this is, if you watch the movie, you watch the full clip, they're, they're making this happen, and there's, it's a stressful moment, and, they're, and pretty soon they see the carbon dioxide levels lower. There's a key moment in this video clip, though, that Tom Hanks, where he looks at Kevin Bacon and Bill Paxton, and he says, just breathe normally, guys, because you could just tell they were like, <gasps> and Tom Hanks says, just breathe normally. And um, it's interesting because as I go throughout sort of uh, UVU leadership and we start thinking about all the various crises that could come to a campus, right? And I, I work with my, my assistant, Kim. Uh, when I first started 16 months ago, uh, I remember her coming to my office and she's fine with me sharing this story because I've shared it enough and I've asked her permission. But I remember her coming to my office first week in and she's like, Okay, this just happened. What are we gonna do? And I was like, what do we usually do? She's like, well, this is what we used to do. And I was like, did it work? She's like, well, but they wanna know this. And I said, well, first of all, let's just have a seat. Let's just breathe. <laughs> like, we're fine. This is not a crisis. This is somebody got upset about something and we'll figure it out. The more you practice creativity, the more you can actually put things into perspective and say, hey, we've got really smart people around us, we'll figure this out. And so when leaders are trying to make decisions, the more diverse your teams and the more you foster creativity and empower your teams to be creative, the quicker you'll come up with solutions. Because if you're in an environment where you can't make any mistakes, people are too rigid to, they don't want to make any suggestions because if that suggestion fails, then what happens, right? They might be let go or whatever. So if that leader, if you as a leader can then say, hey, you develop a culture where Let's try that. Let's try that. Let's keep going. People will want to solve the problems. And what happens to crises? Crises go down. Why? Because one person's crisis is just another person's problem to solve. 
okay? Right now, my children uh, in my home, they will scream and kick because of, they'll fighting with each other, and one's like, he's touched my hair, okay? And that's a crisis for them at that moment. Now you ratchet that up and you start talking about the work environment or your colleagues or whatever, and there are actual real issues, real tough problems, but one thing I've learned from the leaders that I've been surrounded with is there is a sense of unflappableness, meaning that they don't get too worked up. They let some air out of that balloon before it pops. Does that make sense? The pressure because of their creativity and their ability to empower creativity among others. All right. Look afresh. Creativity, as has been said, consists largely of rearranging what we know in order to find out what we do not know. Hence, to think creatively, we must be able to look afresh at what we normally take for granted. And here's something. This is a, this is a groundbreaking tool. Groundbreaking instrument. There was an experiment done where elementary students were given this and asked within five minutes to come up with as many uses for this device as possible. And then the same quiz was given to law students. Law students. In groups. At different times of the day, different groups of elementary kids and law students. Different days, trying different things. On average, the elementary students came up with 15 more ideas of how to use this crazy device, okay? Now what I want you to do really quickly is just turn to a neighbor, turn to anybody near you, and just list off five ways you can use this random metal thing. Go. <coughs> Can I go till five more minutes or ten more minutes or what? Is that? Okay. I'll just, just ten more minutes maybe. 20 seconds. And time. Who feels like they came up with a pretty creative list that you can share with the group here? Just start throwing out two or three items. Yes. You're volunteering someone else, so. Oh, is it like Yeah. Oh, take it. Okay. Uh, we came up with, like, back scratcher. Yes. Yes, back scratcher. <laughs> By the way, if they say something that you came up with as well, you just snap. Just, it's sort of like our little poetry snap. Like, we agree. Okay. What else? On the creativity scale, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just. Something to protect yourself, like a shank. Ah, wow. Wow, you went there. Okay. Who else? Who else? Yes. Sorry, go for it. An earring. Okay. Yes. A gender identifier to send out. Yes. Please explain. So, it's like yes, yes. <laughs> what else? Yes. <gasps> Did you say when you spray paint? <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes, you make little, um, little stencils, right? Little shapes. Okay, what else? Ah, yes. I would love to actually see that come back. That'd be, that's awesome. Yes. You can pick a lock with it. Pick a lock. Zipper fixer. Reset button on your phone. There's all these, right? Now, if we shared the full list here, we could probably have a pretty remarkable list. But I bet you that the elementary kids would still beat you all. I bet you. Because they're so uninhibited about the functionality of something like this. They're so uninhibited. And especially when you put one in their hand and they start brainstorming while they're fidgeting with the thing and they're bending it. And so this is Ken Robinson's point. Schooling educates creativity out of people, that sort of trial and error, that, that, that exploration. And as leaders, I would hope that you foster this sort of genuine like curiosity about the world around you. And by so doing, you start to realize I'm having an impact in a very deliberate way by empowering people to use their creati creativity. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on this other than to say there's another book. How many of you are familiar with Mindset?
Okay, she talks about growth mindset and fixed mindset. I won't go into this due to time other than to say this, this side over here, these are questions you need to ask yourself. Which side of this are you on when it comes to, I can learn, any, I, I can learn anything I want to, I'm either good at it or I'm not, I'm very fixed. Or when I'm frustrated, I still persevere, I push through. Over here, when I'm frustrated, I give up. I want to challenge myself. I don't like to be challenged. When I fail, I learn. When I fail, I'm no good. By the way, folks, we carry certain narratives with us from the time we were very little, based on certain experiences we had when we were little, in schooling, at home. And there might be some circumstances, it could even include your birth order or whatever, certain circumstances where you're like, wow, I kinda, I kinda have some of the things over here on the fixed mindset. And how do we then move to the growth mindset? All right. Moving to the growth mindset, let me tell you two ways that I've personally invested in trying to move to a growth mindset. Okay, so one is to set visible goals. How many of you have ever done a vision board? Okay, some of you are like, uh, I haven't and I never will <laughs> because that seems um, hokey and it seems like I've got to get a lot of magazines and some glue and I don't want to do it. <laughs> so let me tell you how I do mine and let me let you know that I see mine every day and basically a vision board helps in a number of ways. But before I sort of jump there, why, why have you done vision boards? What is it about a vision board that helps people actually accomplish things? Or is it all just a mystical science? Yeah. It allows emotion to come into the mix. When you look at something, it, it promotes you to feel, and feeling promotes action. Ah, okay, mic drop moment, yeah. Yes. Every day. Yes. And you will find new pathways to reach your goals. Beautiful. Yes. I was just going to say that it helps remind you the big picture. And I know that sounds silly, but if you have a vision board for all the trips that you want to take in a year, you put little pictures of all the different places you want to go. When you save that money or when you pick up an extra shift or when you don't go out to eat with your friends or whatever, it helps remind you of your big picture and why you do all the little tasky things yeah. that get you towards your goals. Excellent. Yes. Ah. Because, you know, so often through the course of life, it's easy to forget who we are, and it's easy to get off track. Yeah. So when I'm able to put all these ideas and thoughts and pictures and dreams together, it's like, okay, this is who I am. I have a visual representation of who I am and who I want to continue to be. Love that. I saw a lot of head nodding on that one. A lot of, oh, I'm, see, see, you're already into it. Yes. Okay. This is one, a random one I pulled off the internet, but I'm, I'm gonna share my personal one here for 2019 in just a second. I will say there is something psychologically, this is not like a pseudoscience, folks. Visualizing something actually helps to imprint it on our brains as a possibility. So even if we can't afford something right now, by putting it out in the universe, and oh, and by the way, the other punchline is the moment you actually share your vision board with friends, you wouldn't believe how many people around you actually want to help you fulfill your vision board. You wouldn't believe how many people, once I put this one on Facebook, there were folks reaching out and being like, oh, I can help you with that one. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> I just messaged you, okay? So this is mine. Uh, that's my family, those are my kids. That is Kaimi, the one that made the uh, unicorn tear uh, cookies. And this is Anuheya, look at that face right there. <laughs> She's ready to kiss anybody, okay? Uh, this is my wife, Michelle. Don't worry, this is not a picture of my, my fitness goals. I'm actually writing a Pacific, uh, a Pacific Islander youth fiction superhero book right now. I'm on chapter 16, and it's all about the Pacifica Seven, these seven youth fiction characters that come together, find their powers by connecting to their demigods, one of them being Maui and whatnot. And I chose seven, well, I've got seven kids. So I'm writing this book, and so this is an image that helps me kind of keep on track with um, just when I'm at night, 11 o'clock, I don't know what you're doing at 11, but I'm at home working on my book. Uh, it's so fun, it's a creative outlet. This is to get more sleep, because for nine years that I worked with President Holland, I did not know what that felt like. I didn't know what that was. And so when I got this new job, I was like, I'm gonna try this thing called sleep for more than five hours. And, uh, and then health. So you see family wellness, personal, professional growth and wellness. This is a PowerPoint I just did on my computer. So I don't have to get magazines to cut it out. I just pulled these images from the internet or from my family and then now I could just put them on my computer and I can see it. Want to see the vision board of my son, Keave? So this guy created, they each created one, by the way, that we printed out and put it in their rooms. But this guy, so he writes down his vision board and then we go and find his images. 
This is him. <laughs> Check out his goals for 2019. These are legit, by the way. He's four. He's four. Now, can you imagine my wife and I sitting at the table there like, Kiabe, no, nope, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Are you kidding me? Like, him putting this out there, go to a mountain? Like, yeah, we'll go, buddy. We'll go a couple times. We're going to fulfill those dreams. Go to Toy Store, cut back on candy. Do you know why he put that there? Because about a week before, he had like six cavities. And we were like, bad parenting moment. And so what he said was, no candy. He, but he drew a candy and put a big no through it. And I was like, dude, let's be real, okay? Just cut back to like seven pieces a day, all right? Because before you were at, you were north of 12, all right? We would find in his sock drawer just candy wrappers and stuff. But look at that face. How do you say no to that face right there? And then he's like, go to a swim park and go to Lagoon. Boom, together. We're going to do those together. I know, right? You can do both. And we can get him a a toy at the toy store at the same spot. So really, in one weekend, we can take care of Kiabe, okay? <laughs> now, is he going to remember this growing up? I don't know. Every year, maybe we have to... My, my 14-year-old son, his is a little different. His is like, uh, get faster, you know. <laughs> just, just get more speedy at my 100-yard dash. Yeah, like, and I'm like, dude, all right. I'm like trying to be like a cool dad, but like, I'm like, I, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get faster. Four ways to jumpstart your creativity. I would note these four things down because you can start this today. Four ways to clear the, and this is what I'll end on. Capture. Whenever you hear something, you've got to have some form of journal, whether that's on your phone, whether that's you taking pictures and you're having a visual journal, whether that's a, a notepad that's in your purse or in your pocket. You've got to capture the greatness that's around you. You will get a spark in a random, you're at Panda Express, and all of a sudden, you get a fortune, and then you're like, huh, I wish I had something to keep this. And so what do you do? You roll it up, and you put it somewhere, but you never remember where you put it. And so it's a spark. How are you going to capture this? So you take a picture with your phone, do whatever, but capture the sparks that influence you and get you excited about life and the impact you want to have. Two, surround yourself with interesting people and things. That's what Cal is all about, by the way. That's the beauty of a program like this, is you get to actually rub shoulders with other people who actually want to make a difference and who actually care about their impact and have leadership. And you learn from each other way more than you learn from me or from Belinda or from some administrator. You, throughout this program, will learn from each other. The spark will come from one another. Surround yourself with really interesting people, interesting ex experiences and interesting things. Watch TED Talks, right? Challenge, tackle tough problems. If you've never done something before, my goodness, try it. There's something about our greatest progress comes from stepping out of what? Our comfort zones, and you all know that. Your greatest pro personal progress has come from you trying something that you didn't know if you could do, and you did it. The greatest struggles, the, the moments we've learned the most are coming from struggle. When we really, it, look, we don't learn from somebody if I say, hey, I, I think this, and you're like, I agree, and I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this, and you're like, yeah, I agree, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> And where we learn is, I say like this, and you're like, hmm, I disagree, why, why do you, and then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, and we're struggling, wrestling, and pretty soon we both learn something. Growth comes from that struggle, from the challenge, okay? Fourth, broadening, expand your knowledge. Folks, if you're not a reader, I didn't read a book cover to cover. I was busy engaging in graffiti art. I did not read a book cover to cover until I was 19 years old. I have set a goal to read a book every week or listen to a book. Let's be real. You can listen to Audible, you can listen to some of these things. To book a week. Um, I'm up to, since I set the goal something like 15 years ago, I'm up to 420 books or something, random stuff. By the way, this includes Harry Potter and this includes, uh, you know, 100 page books that are on, on, you know, leadership and this and that, but some of the other ones are heavier. It includes Alexander Hamilton ever since I saw the, the, the musical and I was like, shoot, now I gotta read the book and the book was amazing, right? And then I'm just listening to um, ever since I've been writing this, this youth fiction book, I've been listening to Percy Jackson, and I've been listening to all these other books to help me with the creative process. Folks, I, I don't think I'm smarter necessarily. I think it's, life is more interesting because I read those books. I think I'm making connections with other people because of those books. All right? Finally, find your creative outlets. What helps you think freely? This is what helps me think freely. I design shoes now. I design shoes based on my cultural background. And so this was my first pair of shoes I did with one Sharpie marker. This was way before the movie Moana came out, by the way. 
and I designed seven different stories of Maui on a pair of vans. Um, I then did this pair of shoes called the First Wave uh, with a few other micron markers and stuff. And so what I decided to do with my artwork is instead of tagging and promoting graffiti and some of that stuff, and I still, by the way, promote it, but as a commissioned mural, right? I want my students to get paid to do murals for businesses and whatnot. But I promote this, uh, I decided to take my artwork and do more study about my own history and heritage as a native Hawaiian. And then my wife wanted a pair of shoes, but she wanted it on heels, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with the heels? And so then I created this for her. And so it's got the K, my initials K and Michelle, K and M. And then my daughter wouldn't go to, element, wouldn't go to kindergarten, Kaimi, the same Kaimi, wouldn't go to kindergarten. And I'm like, I'll make you a pair of shoes if you go five days in a row. And she's like, fine. So then she went to kindergarten, and I made her this pair of shoes, butterflies. There's the butterfly stem in the middle, body with the wings, and so anytime she got nervous at school, she could just look down at her shoes and be like, oh, Dad loves me, all right? He remembers, okay? And then my mother-in-law, who's down in the Navajo Nation with the Navajo weaving, the rug weaving, and so I did a pair of wedges for her. I didn't even know what wedges were. I was like, these are heels, and they're like, they're wedges, and I'm like, okay. And then it just got, from there, just cleats for my nieces, and for my colleague here at UVU, a longhorn with the nostrils right here and then the eyes and this sort of Texas longhorn all the way back. And then my son, futsal shoes for my son. And then for my colleague, Victor. And then I did one for Dwayne The Rock Johnson, size 14. And this pair of shoes we sent him. His nephew lives in Salt Lake. Uh, he's Samoan. He's part Samoan. So we sent him this pair of shoes um, while he was filming a show called Ballers in Miami. And so his mother received it on his behalf, sent us a nice note. Authenticity. Folks, here's my final word. Don't worry so much about what other people are telling you you are or aren't. For a while growing up in Southern California, I was wondering, am I smart enough or am I Hawaiian enough or am I Filipino enough or am I, my, my father was Catholic, my mother Mormon, and not really knowing where I was religiously. Uh, I was a graffiti artist. Was I street enough? Was I gangsta enough? I was like, definitely not. I was like, I don't want to hurt anybody. And, um, but for so long, I was defining my sense of place and authenticity by what other people were telling me what it was. And it wasn't until I found my purpose in education. I, I love this field of education. I love UVU. I love, I, I've been here 16 years. I love what we stand for, I love what we do, I love the fact that we're inclusive, I love the fact that we get to provide opportunities like for this for students to find their spark. And once you find your spark, it doesn't matter almost what people think of you. You find your authenticity once you find it, what it is you're fighting for. So find what it is that you want, the impact you wanna make in this world, okay? Don't worry about that. Uh, this is my last slide. Connect with me on social media if you'd like. Um, or if you just want to email me and say, hey, can I just unpack some of the things you talked about just for 15, 20 minutes? I love meeting with students. So with that, thanks so much for letting me share some thoughts with you today.